And there we go. So today, like I said, starting chapter 15, so we're starting kind of the calc two in multivariable functions unit. So, you know, what did we do in calc two? Well, we focused on integration and the applications of integration, right? Uh, area problems and what they really translate to in the physical world, volume problems, what they translate to in the physical world. And now we're gonna see how that scales up when we, you know, we were doing that in 2D essentially, and now we're gonna be doing it in 3D or, you know, n-dimensional um, integration. What does that mean? How does it look? How do we carry it out? So we're gonna start with a quick refresher on definite integrals. I like to like refresh on the Calc 1 idea or the Calc 2 idea before extending it. So we'll do that and then we'll punch through again some applications and examples of these things. As always, stop me with questions as we go. So let's start with some notes and we'll recall the following from R2 Calc 2 and really the end of Calc 1 really that we had this operation called integration on a function of our input and what this really translated to was on the graph if we had our f of x between some interval a and b, well really what I'd like to do is try it like this, it gave us the area under this curve, right? So for a given function, x is our input, and it's on, right, this interval a to b of input values, and we found that this was equal to the net change in the antiderivative. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? This piece. We're really just focusing in on this here today, that this equals the area under the curve. So what does it look like in R3? Well, I'm gonna show you what it looks like and then explain it more in depth later. Um, but I just like to have this parallel uh, next to each other. So in you know, R3, Keep hitting us. So in R3, it looks like this, where we're integrating over some region R. A function of two inputs. You see a double integral here, because we're integrating once with respect to each input variable. I have this dA over here, which means we're, respect, we're integrating with respect to the area. Instead of little bits of length, we're talking now about little nudges of area. And so what this is going to correspond to is a total of volume, right? Because what do you get when you um, multiply some number times little bits of area? Well, you're summing up now volumes instead of areas, right? Because you've added on a length to the width and height. Not added on, multiplied on. So it might look something like this. Right, and what we usually do is we break it up with four limits of integration here, and we write it, you know, in this fashion where here's A and B along my x-axis, here's C and D along my y-axis. We call this region R, and this is like my input space just like this over here was my input space, right? And so then I might have some surface that's defined by f of x, y on the top doing something like this. That's over the top of this region. And what we're really finding with these double integrals is the volume of this solid that you see here, sitting above R and resting beneath this F of X, Y. Okay, so that's kind of the, the leap we're making today. And then again, applications of what we can do with it. And this is really just the beginning. You'll remember that 
integration is not just you know 10% harder than differentiation. It's quite a bit more challenging than differentiation. So there's going to be some stuff that we got to contend with here. Um, the one I've, the setup I've drawn for you right here, this is a very nice input space, right? Um, before, we only really had one option. You could only worry about your interval of one dimension. But now my input space could be a rectangle, it could be a circle, it could be some irregular region, right? And it's like, well, how, do, how are we going to integrate over something that's, you know, ir irregularly defined? What would that look like? So we're going to have to deal with that. We're actually going to eventually come up to changing coordinate systems as making the integral easier, right? So shifting the way that we orient ourselves, so moving to spherical or um, cylindrical coordinate systems when things are round, which might sound a little crazy, but really it makes problems a lot easier. Think about, you know, remember from polar coordinates, that's like an extension of polar, how, um, right, a, let me write this down here. So in the future, you know, irregular R's, round surfaces or regions might require us to go to spherical coordinates or cylindrical. And again, to address like, that seems like a, a giant step, but remember rectangular versus polar in R2, we look at a circle which has this really bummer of an equation, x squared plus y squared equals r squared, which you know isn't an explicit equation, can't be solved for y, versus you know in polar we might see something like r equals one, that's the unit circle. So how much nicer is that to deal with than x squared plus y squared equals one, right? So eventually we'll be looking at that to simplify these problems, but today just becoming accustomed with the idea of integrating along multiple dimensions. And I do apologize for Bowden. He's really getting after it in there. Can you guys hear him? No? Okay, that's awesome. See, he's wailing. So, <laughs> protesting nap time, aren't we all? So, we have simple situations today. Uh, round and regular stuff we'll deal with later. And again, just to remember that integration is harder than differentiation. So, remembering your differentiation rules will just make this easier. But let's jump into it here and review the uh, definite integral process. So remember how we did this was with Riemann sums. And we would take area under this curve from A to B. We'd slice it up into equal sub intervals, right? We'd call this little nudge delta x as we'd scoot over. We'd call this guy x naught, we'd call this guy x sub m. So we'd have m subdivisions. And then on each subinterval, we would pick some point. So here's, you know, x2, somewhere in the middle. So we'll call it x2 star. Somewhere in this interval, we'd pick that point on the x axis and then grab its output value, f sub x2 star. And what we would go ahead and grab is this, this little rectangle with a top that's not perfect, and we'd be able to approximate the area by adding all these up, right? So here's, you know, some delta x times f of x sub i star equals this little area of this guy. Total area under f of x from a to b was approximately the sum from i to m of those heights times delta x. 
right? Remember that sigma is just total them up. And so we do our best to approximate these. And we knew that as M got bigger, accuracy increased, right? The more subdivisions I take, I make those things razor thin. We take the limit of that process. And that's what gets us the definite integral. It gets us the exact area under the curve. So the integral from A to B of f of x dx, we said was the, oops, the limit as m goes to infinity, the sum from i equals one to m of the height times the width. as the total area under the curve. So they were interchangeable in that way. And again, we called this here like our sample point. And depending on what point we chose in the, um, in the sub interval, that determined what rule we were using, right? So choice determined whether we're using the left-hand sum, right-hand sum, or the midpoint rule, or trap rule, etc. Right, remember those numerical approximations. So where I choose it um, gives me the that algorithm, or you can just do it manually and choose one for each subinterval. But we call it xi star to represent, that's the sample point. And I'm going over these details because it's nice to have this to draw a line to when we scale it up a dimension. So this is the area under this. And again, I want to highlight from x equals a to x equals b. So there's ways to do that numerically and to use a computer to crunch that area or approximate it or do a really good job, or we could use the fundamental theorem to compute it exactly, right? By finding the antiderivative, if you could, you could get this area. And so this is the process of limiting Riemann sums. Now, how does this scale up? Well, essentially we do it twice. Um, I'm gonna try to make sense of how this works and why it works as we go. But essentially, we're doing it twice. We're integrating in one direction and then holding one constant and then integrating in the other. And when we do that, we're getting kind of, you could think of it as like a base, a cross-sectional area times another dimension. And what happens when you do that? Right, like a cylinder, you get the cross-section of the circle, pi r squared, I multiply it by height. What do I have now? It's not a circle. Cylinder, cylinder. yeah. So that third dimension makes it volume from area. So same thing, if I integrate in one dimension, I'm getting area. Then I multiply by another dimension, I'm gonna turn it into volume. So that's, that's what we're doing. So we'll do some definitions here and sketch this out. So let's let R be this region. And I'll first define it like this. But this might not mean much to you. This is the Cartesian product between these two intervals. And what this really means is it's the set of all points x, y, such that x is between A and B, and y is between C and D. But it's helpful to think of it like this because you can think of, all right, it's one interval times another, so I'm going to get a square from two lengths, right, or a rectangle. And we'll let um, Z
be a surface that is, we're going to say integrable over R. And I'm not going to get too excited about the word integrable here. Just know that it's continuous with the exception of maybe finitely many curves is what we'll say. Okay, so there could be a few curves, finitely many where it's discontinuous, but otherwise it's just a nice surface. So just pretend for uh, illustration that that's the case. But in more general, you can have some, some weirdness there. So we've got the surface on top of this region. So let's sketch out what we're thinking. So again, along the X and Y, I've got some A to B and some C to D. Here's my Z axis. So then R is this rectangular region that's sitting out in the XY plane. Okay, and we have a surface that's sitting over top of it. So like I drew before, something like this. I might have a All right. So these are over these boundary points here. OK. So I'm going to talk about a third structure here. Let S be the solid that this forms. OK, if I project walls down from this, let it be the set of x, y, z points such that x, y are in the region, and that z is a function of x, comma, y. Actually, let me, let me write that better. Let me write that better. This last part, we're letting z values be the region between 0 and f of x, y, right? So that we include all those z values. So S becomes this block with a weird top. So our goal is to find the volume of S, because this will correspond to the definite integral in this in R3. So let's break down how this works. So if we zoom in on just R in the XY plane, What we end up doing is slicing it like we did before into equidistant little segments here. So like here, we'd call this delta x, how much I nudge over in the x direction. And then we'll do the same thing in the y direction going up. Call that delta y. And I should have made this bigger, so instead I'll just like kind of zoom in and blow this picture up here. And say, you know, right here at this point, 
This is the point with some x sub i and some y sub j. So here I'm letting, you know, a be my x naught and b be my xm like I did before. And I'm going to do the same thing with y. Let this be y naught and let it go up to some nth y value. Where I've, you know, got y1, y2, all the way up, x1, x2, all the way up to m. So for some random one I pulled in here, I'm going to call it x, y, y, j. This is where they intersect at these two lines. We'll call this rectangle in here r sub i, j. And I might pull any point from in here to be my sample point. So we'll call that x i star y j star. Okay. So let's see. So the reason I'm, I want to call this in general is because I'm going to do this with each one of these boxes, right? I'm going to grab the height on the surface over each one of these boxes and then add up the volume of all those boxes. Okay, so that's the process. So I want to be able to do this at each sub one. So what's going to happen is you're looking over this grid on the xy plane, but above that is the top of the surface. So there's really these um, little towers over each one. And at the top, Is that my j star? So that's that height here. And then the length and width of this thing are delta x by delta y. So really, the volume of each of these is that height f of xi star y j star times those little bits of area which are delta x times delta y and so the reason i break it down like that is so you can see this is really equal to the height times some cross-sectional area a right like the face of the box times the height And so since there's m subdivisions here and n subdivisions in the y direction, obviously the accuracy increases as m and n get bigger. So I'll show you what I'm talking about with a visualizer here. Actually, we're going to wait on this. We're going to wait on this. I'll come back to that. But you can picture over each one of these and sitting beneath this, right, are these little boxes that we're going to sum up. And if we were able to add all those up, we'd get the total volume or a really good approximation for it, right? Okay, so we'd say that the volume is going to be approximately the, the double sum, i equals 1 to m, j equals 1 to n, the xi star, yj star heights, times what we're calling delta a, where you know your delta a is really delta x times delta y. So we're summing in two directions, grabbing those heights, and our little chunks as we're moving is no longer a bit of length, but a bit of area. So the limit of this process is this. We call it the double integral dA, and that's the limit as m and n go to infinity 
of this double sum. Delta A. And so that's the volume of this solid. We're going to go through an example to show you exactly what I mean by this, and then we will use the visualizer. But I did want you to get this down, the formal definition of what this means, where it comes from. And hopefully at this point you have a good idea of what each of these symbols really means. All right? You've got your height, and you've got your you know, cross-sectional area. When you multiply those and add them up, you've got to get a volume. All right. So let's use the midpoint rule. To estimate the volume. under this uh, paraboloid on the region negative 1 to 3 cross with 0, 4. With four subdivisions on the x direction and two subdivisions on the y direction. So what this means really is m equals 4, n equals 2, and this will give us an estimate of the double integral. So a really important part of this is actually to sketch it out, and you don't need to sketch the surface, we're going to do the 2D kind of overview. So you think about, all right, I'm going from negative 1 to 3 on the x, so I'll start here, negative 1, 1, 2, 3. And then I'm going from 0 to 4 in the y, so maybe we'll make this a little longer as well. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then how am I going to slice this up? Well, it's 4 in the x direction. So one, two, three, four subdivisions, right? One, two, three, four, and then two in the Y. So I'm going to split those up with a length of two, that and like that. So really what we should get is a grid like this. And then two cutting across in the Y direction. All right, so we're using the midpoint rule here. Midpoint equals sample point. So what that means is that we're going to grab a sample point from the middle of each of these sub intervals to orient ourselves, and then we'll shoot up to grab the height so that we can add up all those boxes. So luckily these will be uh, pretty easy to figure out where they're at. Figure out their x and y coordinates. All right, so the first row here will be negative a half with a height of one, and then one half with a height of one, all of these have a height of one, three halves, and two and a half, which is five halves and one. And then the next second row, I'll have a height of three. The 
Everybody see where I'm getting these from? Okay. Anybody need me to slow down a little bit? I feel like I'm cruising. All right. So these are my sample points. We've got eight of them, one for each rectangle. So if we're trying to estimate the volume, we know the volume is the double integral. And I'm writing this just to kind of remind us what this thing is. And that's approximated by the sum from 1 to m and from 1 to n. Delta a. And um, for the midpoint rule, we actually use this notation with the bar over the top. It says you're the, you're the midpoint. of the interval from x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. So you got to ask yourself, self, do I have all the required components to carry out this sum? You'll say, well, I've got my points, which I need. So I'm going to need to go in and get their heights right on the surface at those given points. And then I'm going to need this delta a which is uniform across it, right? So we know that our delta A is what a width of one by a height of two. So that's an area of two for each of those. So we're gonna want to get the heights for each of these input points. But we can do that on the fly. So what we're going to do is break it down and say, well, when i equals 1, then we're looking at the sum. We do the, if you've ever done any, you know, nested loops in a computer programming course, this is exactly the same process. It's hold one index constant, let the other span through, and tick that one up, let the other one span through, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're going to hold i equals 1 constant and then let j do its thing. So from j equals 1 to 2. We'll do the f of the x sub x sub 1, j sub, or y sub j's, delta a. We know delta a is just 2, so what I'm actually going to do is just write that in as a 2 here. And so I'm going to pull that 2 out to the left, and then I know that I'm looking for The height at negative one half one plus negative one half, um, or sorry, x of one, yeah, yeah, negative one half and three. So what is that? Well, that's 2 times, you know, a half squared plus 1 squared. So that's 5 quarters plus uh, this guy over here. So it's 5 quarters plus 4 quarters plus 9. Wait, did I do that right? Yeah. 9 plus a quarter. So what, 37 quarters? That doesn't seem right. 42, no, that's too much. Going too quick, let's scale that down here. So x squared plus y squared. Let 
forgetting that I should have nine here. That doesn't seem to add up. Ten and a half, two times ten point five. Twenty one. Am I missing something? Um, for, mm -hmm. for the point, is it supposed to be like one and three, or is it supposed to be like one half and for the y? <laughs> you know what? Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. For the y values, it's supposed to be one and three because we're looking at these guys here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. I couldn't see the thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what I'm missing here. If I can avoid an error, I will do it. Oh, 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 I changed the surface. That's what. Oh, we'll just roll with this. That's fine. My initial surface was not x squared plus y squared. It was x squared plus y. So we will just roll with a new one. So 21. Actually, it's probably better to go back to the other one. Let's just switch out the, the surface. So just get rid of that squared. Make up your mind, Mally. Hey, lighten up, OK? Leave me alone. <laughs> no, it'd be better to just go with the plan. So yeah, this is under x squared plus y. All right. so. Because we haven't done anything with that yet. So let's go ahead and grab those. So this should work out to be 9. That's why I didn't see it. So that's uh, 1 quarter plus 1, all plus 1 quarter plus 3, which in there is 4 and a half. So that's 2 times 4.5. OK. So that's for i equals 1. I'm not going to make a slog through all these. We'll do one more just because that one was not the smoothest thing in the world. Um, let me make sure that went. Okay. All right. So for i equals 2, again, we're doing the sum from j equals 1 to 2 of f of x2, y sub j, all times 2 which again will pull out that two. And so the heights that this is giving us is, well, x2 is positive a half, and then the y values again are one and three. So f of one plus f of one half times three. So that should give us a quarter plus one again, plus a quarter, plus three again, so it should give us nine again. Same thing. And then I'll just write down the setups for these, but I won't make us do them. You're welcome. But you're, again, encouraged to go back and verify this process later. So this should be uh, 17. And then actually, maybe I'll have you guys practice one, just this one here. So for x sub 4, y sub j, what will this last sum amount to?
So you should work out to 33. Questions on that as a process? Seeing, seeing some puzzled looks, let's, let's walk through it real quick. So that last x coordinate is five halves, right? And then I've got a y of one and a y of three. So then we square the x and add the y, so 25 over four plus one, whoops. And so let's see, that'll be 25 over two plus four on the inside. If we want to get, um, have some fun with that. So we'll do uh, 25 over two plus eight over two. So that's two times 33 over two, which should be 33. We find that? Okay, cool. Awesome. So then we have an estimate for the volume. It's going to be the total of all these. So it's 9 plus 9 plus 17 plus 33, which is 68. You know, units cubed. And to give you you know, for some reference, the exact volume under this surface is 69.3 repeating. So we're pretty darn close, okay? Um, obviously, the more curvy the surface, the worse this is going to be with just only eight rectangles um, or eight prisms. But this is essentially what we do, and then we limit this process, right? We obviously don't do that by hand. Um, the computation. But this is what we can feed to a computer and it will you know, do it much faster. But this is what we're doing. We hold one index constant, one x value constant, and then integrate along y, right? Hold one x value constant, integrate along x, or integrate along y, and keep going down the line. Or we could have flipped it, right? We could have gone the other way around. There's nothing that really stopped us from doing that because everything we did was commutative operations, right? Multiplication and addition. Doesn't matter what order you do it in. So we could have done it the other order. So now I wanna show you um, what does a better job at drawing than me, although I hate to admit it, which is the computer. And so I'll show you what I'm using here. So here's our surface over the region where we care about, so x squared plus y. And maybe I'll zoom out a little bit so we can see it better. So it's this kind of, uh, it's, it's linear in one direction and a parabola in another. Let me try one more time to get a better view on it. Okay, like this, yeah. It's kind of got this angled perspective. And now what I'm gonna do is draw in these Riemannian prisms. So you see it, I've got it sliced up like we did um, by hand here. And so it will draw in these rectangles that we just found the area or found the volume of and then summed up. I don't know what this last one is here. Why do we have a uh... Well, I don't know what this weird slant thing on the top is or what that's trying to show. Maybe it's like the average, like the, um, the trapezoid rule. But um, that's, not, that's not what is important. What's important is to see how this is really being approximated. You can see how stacking boxes underneath a surface would make sense if you're trying to approximate its volume, just like stacking rectangles underneath a curve made sense if you're trying to approximate its area. You can see how this looks like a Calc 1 problem from here, and now it's a Calc 3 problem. So. Um, I'm going to link this in the notes and you'll be able to play with it. You can change the number of prisms you use as well as the number of grid lines to get a better estimate. You can, again, cho choose a different sample point using this, which is pretty nice. Um, and then where is the choice of partitions? Oh, here's the number of prisms in each direction. So you can play with that, right? So if I wanted to switch that up and go to eight, 
it would slice up x into more and y into more. And obviously, the more you go, the more accurate it's going to get, but the more computationally heavy it's going to get too. But pretty cool. So that's are what we're the, doing. Uh, yeah. Are the prisms always, or the each individual thing, are they always going to be squares? They don't have to be squares. No. Be it, yeah. In this in this example, they're actually rectangles. They uh, the oh. height. <laughs> well, I they were squares. Okay, never mind. Yeah. No, that's okay. If we scroll up here, our delta a right here. This is the uh, delta x and this is the delta y. So here our length and width are different. So yeah, they don't have to be squares. Cool. The, the height though is, um, is always going to leave us with, regardless of what the bottom shape is, it's going to leave us with a flat top, right? As opposed to like, you know, we kind of did like trapezoid rule in 2D to have a not flat top to get it to fit better. Right. I mean, you could do that. It's just more, it takes more computation to do it. Um, so you can still, you know, you could do a, a plane at the top, something like that. Um, it, it would just takes more time. And so to do it by hand, not worth it, especially when we can just scale up the number of rectangles, probably get more bang for our buck. But there are loads of numerical approximations that you can do, and midpoint is not the only one. So thank you for bringing that up. But um so that is that process shoot back to here all right so again it does a pretty good job obviously mileage varies depending on the surface that you have so that's the numerical tack we can also go the analytic track, which is taking antiderivatives, right, to find these uh, volumes exactly. And so we're going to spend a lot of time with this. We're going to rely on your knowledge of integration techniques. Um, but we use what the process, what's called iterated integration or iterated integrals. And it is exactly what it sounds like, iteration going back over it, right, another time. Um, doing it just like we summed up before, holding one constant and integrating with respect to another. Um, you could also think of this as a uh, partial integration. Because we are holding one constant and, um, and integrating with respect to one variable, just like partial differentiation we held x constant differentiated with respect to y and vice versa. So again what we're going to do here is suppose that f is continuous just to make things easier on the region which is a b cross c d. So again it's a rectangular region. So I'm going to try to sketch this out again here for a slightly different perspective. And we've got some region, that ain't right. Sometimes the snap fit doesn't do it. Neither did that. So here's R. So, what we're going to do, and again, we've got maybe some um, surface up top. Maybe doing something like this. Is we're going to pin an x value. I'll choose actually. This will be easiest to see. So I'm going to pin an x value here. And then what that will do, we'll fix a cutting curve along this surface. And so we can shoot down here. So when we hold 
you know, x constant and we go along this, maybe if I call it some x naught, this curve is really a two-dimensional curve where y varies and x is fixed. And if I wanted to integrate this thing, I could do so using calc 1 slash calc 2. And you can see how it's over this interval of values going to give me a sheet. It's going to give me an area, just like it would do if you were doing it on your desktop, right, in 2D. And so we'll note here that if I constructed some function of x that looked like this, where I integrate from c to d along my curve with respect to y, this will result in a function of x. Right, because whatever it gives me will be in terms of my x coordinate, and it will change if I'm over here or over here with my x coordinate. So whatever x I give you, you'll scan across the surface and give me the area of that sheet hanging down from the top, right? And it will do that along the x interval, so it's really a function of x. That might take a second to sink in. But just knowing that integrating this, holding x fixed, I'm going to get some area that will multiply or, or be in terms of x. And now I can do that in the other direction at the same time. Okay, so just like we were summing up, hold, you know, i equals 1, find all the heights for j, y values, and scale it this way, we're going to do the same thing. So this results in a function of x. So then the integral from a to b of this a of x with respect to x is then the integral. And let me actually put this in yellow here. It's equal to the integral from a to b with respect to x of the integral from c to d f of x and y dy. And so you see these brackets in the middle here indicating this was my function of x that's being integrated with respect to x on the outside, but inside we were integrating with respect to y. And so I just want to note here that we do these inside out. We compute inside out. So we do the same thing and then write across the other way. We go and find, this is going to make the picture a lot more busy, but we go and find the area this way, and in doing that, we're getting those rectangles again, we're getting those prisms again, and we're getting volume. So let's do an example here to drive this home. So let's say I've got a surface x, y squared, and it's over the region r, which goes from 1 to 2, crossed with 3 to 4. And I'm going to use this to drive it a couple big ideas, this example. So to carry this out, And we're saying that the volume here is equal to this double integral. And so I want to go ahead and find this.
d x d y did we do it the other way around we did it the other way around let's do that dy dx so we're looking at the inner integral of the integral from 3 to 4 of xy squared dy before we integrate with respect to dx So again, you think of this as partial integration, which means hold one constant. Consider it constant while you integrate with respect to the one variable. So inside, we're just going to focus on this. Y is my only variable. X is a constant. Treat it like the number 5. So and this is really equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of, when we integrate this power function, we're going to get 1 third xy cubed evaluated between 4 and 3, all dx. And so like I said before, we should evaluate this and then just get a function of x on the inside. So this will be 1 third times x times, I'm factoring that out and just doing the difference. So 4 cubed minus 3 cubed dx, which is really... Uh, what's 64 minus 27, so it should be 37 dx. And so now we have a linear function, which is easy enough to integrate. So I'll pull out that scalar. And so again, we like treated x like a constant. And now y is gone from the equation, which is what we want. Integrate with respect to x. And we'll get 37 over 6x squared from 2 to 1. So that's what, 4 minus 1, which is times 3. So we get 37 over 2. So again, whatever the units of length here are, these are now volume units. So what do we just do? We just found the exact volume under this thing, right? We were able to do much better than numerical approximation because we were able to integrate in both directions. Obviously, it requires that your functions are integrable, right? That you can find the integral, and a lot of times you can't because it's a lot harder than... Uh, differentiation. But when you can, this is awesome. So the next, well, let's see if you guys come up with it. I was going to say the logical next question is blank, but what's a question you think, what's a question you have about this right now? Because we integrated with respect to y first and then x, right? So my question is, is it the same to do it the other way? So what's your gut, what's your gut instinct? Yes. Gut instinct is yes. I'm seeing some head, heads nodding. All right. So what I'd like you to do is try it quickly. Try it the other direction and prove it to yourself. So 
integrate with respect to x first and then y. Did I goof something up here? Let's see. Are we all back? 4 cubed minus, so that's 64 minus 27. I feel like I have an extra scalar here. But what, that's 3 eighths times 64 minus 27 is 37. That ain't right. It's only y squared, right? You you have it being y cubed before you integrate. Before I integrated. It's only y squared before it's you It's only y squared, man. I changed it. Actually, but I didn't even compute that, did I? Squared. Yeah. Oh, and then and then it, it should have canceled that out. From, yeah. Right, so it should have been one half. Exactly. There we go. So seemingly different only if you integrate before you integrate. So yes, it is the same. Um, why is it the same? In a very general way, what we're doing is commutative, right? And the, in, and the intervals that we're integrating along aren't very complicated, so we don't have to account for much. There are situations where this doesn't apply, but in general, if you have... Um, this setup where f is nice and your interval is rectangular, there's this theorem that applies called Fubini's theorem. Um, and it says exactly this, that you can switch the order of integration. And that's really nice. And I don't think it would be too much of a stretch For you to even come up with an example on your own of where, why this would matter, but I'll, I'll construct one for you. So the theorem says um, in a very informal way, if f is continuous on a region, some rectangular region, and you can switch the order of integration. And I didn't do it yet here, but I've done it previously where it might be nice to write in here, this is really y equals c to d, and this here, this is x equals a to b. Just to remind your brain that 
These are two different variables here. Uh, C, C here. Also to maybe draw in some brackets to remind yourself that you do these inside out. And obviously, like, like I just did, you can fast forward on those rules in your head and just make a silly mistake and then you end up with something wrong. So just take it slow. Um, but why this is nice, there's a few reasons, but one comes down to the computation end of things. So consider this, and we won't do it all the way through, but I'll, you can see where it's going to go. Consider the double integral from x equals 2 to 4 and y equals pi to 2 pi of x sine xy dy dx. So if I do it in the order that it's currently in, like this, with respect to y first. So I said it's like two to four. Well, this would leave me with a pretty nice antiderivative inside because x we're treating as a constant, right? So it's a scalar, and the antiderivative of a scalar times sine with a scalar times y on the inside, it's not a bad antiderivative, right? So the antiderivative of this ends up being negative cos 2 pi x plus cos pi x dx when all said and done because this thing becomes what? Um, negative, negative cos xy when you anti-differentiate. So that's pretty nice. And then you could go about this and that's, that's an easy integral to carry out. But if I went in the other direction and you chose to go with respect to x first, of x sine xy dx dy. Well, then this inner part here, I have to do integration by parts, right? Because I have a product of two functions. So then I got to do, you know, integral of u dv equals uv minus integral v du. Set up that whole thing even before I integrate with respect to y. Right? So that's, that's kind of a lot of work. So what we get you know, x plus integral of x cos x, y. You actually have to go to the table on this one, I'm pretty sure. So that'd be pretty rough. So depending on which way you choose, it can go from doable to not doable. Or kind of difficult to a lot easier. So applying this theorem to say, I'd rather go this way first and then deal with that second integral afterwards, it will come up quite a bit. Um, at the end here, what I want to do is just kind of arm you with some pretty, I mean, I'm not going to say they're easy to see, but they're logical conclusions that follow from what we've done that will help you in your, in your practice problems greatly, okay? So one of which is if you got a chance to see, um, so we'll do like three, three parting facts. For the first, if you recall, average value of f on a, b, We said that the average value of f in 2d was divided by the length of the interval and then multiplied by the integral of f from a to b. 
Remember that? It's like the weighted average. See it? Find the area under the curve and then divide by the length of the curve and that gives you like the weighted average value of a curve. It's a really nice result. So that's from, that's from R2. And so you can think about how, all right, we took the area and then divided by the length of the interval to get the average height. So what would I have to do to get the average height of the surface in R3? Well, I'd need to divide not by the length of the interval, but by the area of the base, right? The area of the region underneath. That would give me the average height. So in R3, what you can do to get the F average for a function of two variables is one over the average, or the area of the region, the area of the region, times the double integral of the region of F dA. So again, if you didn't cover this, uh, it's okay. It, it should make sense, right? Like your average test score, you add up the values then divide by how many tests you have. That's the discrete version. This is the continuous version of that. So this is, this is a very widely used application of integrals, is finding the average value of a, of a continuous function that's nonlinear. So, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do any examples with that because it's literally just dividing by the area, which if you have a rectangle, length times width, right? You've got, you guys have got that. So uh, two other facts that are maybe less obvious, so one, which is really nice, which is if, I'll say, if f of x, y can be split into g of x and h of y, particularly not split into, I want to be careful, times only. This does not work if they're added together. Okay. If it can be split into a product of, two functions x and y, then the double integral over r can be split into the two integrals where one is integrated with respect to its own input. So I'll give you a quick example to show you what I mean. And this actually wouldn't have applied to that last nasty one either. So we'll say, you know, find this where R is the region from negative two to three, cross with zero to pi over two. Well, here it's the case that I can split it into some g of x and some h of y, right, being multiplied together. Again, this does not work for addition, only when it's a product. And so what we can do is say, well, then this is going to be equal to, right, the integral from x equals negative 2 to 3 y equals zero to pi over two. I'm just gonna write it out before we split it. So dy dx can split it into a dx integral and a dy integral. And then we don't need a product rule or anything like that, right? This is easy enough to do. Where we get this here, and then this guy over here, you'll have to go to, you'll have to go to the table of um, integrals or use that nice trig identity. All right, but now this one's easy to do. 
because there's no squared term. But you should work this out to be 5 pi over 8 if you want to finish that off on your own. But again, that's, that's going to be a lot nicer than doing them back to back integrated because what are you going to do? You're going to get a product and, um, well, actually this one will work out okay. But sometimes it doesn't and it just makes a lot of sense to split these up. And you can think of it as being, you know, the cross sections this way are all the same, cross sections this way are all the same. I'm multiplying those two together to get that volume. So it's a nice one that comes up often. So if you can spot it, um, you know, that's good. And again, this does not apply. You know, if I had x squared cos squared y, uh, what is it? you know, plus x, actually that would work. If I did like plus x, y, now it's broken, right? Does not apply. Has to be product. Um, and then the last fact. Can you? Yep. Um, just wondering, can you like, for instance, that one that it's broken on, right? Yes. Um, you can't like. Actually, is it broken here? I was thinking, can you like back you out an X? Yeah, you totally could. Uh, what should I do to make this better? Oh, if I had this, thanks. I had a different one. I actually had brackets well, around this. I, I, I guess my, my question was deeper than that example. It was, if you can factor something out, can you then treat that thing that's multiplied as its own thing, even if the thing that it's multiplied by is still going to be a double integral? Can you essentially like factor out a single integral and then just to make the double integral easier to do. So like, for example, here, let's see if this is what you're talking about. I could factor out an x squared here and do just that. All right, so I can rewrite this as, um, the integral of x squared times one plus three co squared y dy dx, and now I have my, here's my g of x, here's my h of y, and this does apply. Is that what you're talking about? No, I meant like in a situation where, it, like, take this same example you have, only let's say you have cosine of yx there. Okay. So, so after you factor out your x squared, your second half of it is still going to be something that has y and x. Yeah. Can you do g of x times a simpler double integral? No. Okay. Because so this is no longer yeah. Because it impact that input now impacts the heights of the other ones. So you know they have to they have to stick together. Good question. This only applies if you can do it just like this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. But yes, always keep looking out for the most efficient way to do it. Um, I think in this program, we emphasize a lot of like do what makes sense when it comes to algebra and, and graphical solutions and things like that. And I think that's a very good practice to, to do. Uh, and we kind of do some hand-waving when it comes to simplifying. Here, you're going to want to take care of that bookkeeping as you go and be aware of what you're doing because it will, again, if you don't simplify something that could be simplified easily, you didn't spot it, you left something in brackets and the scalars could collapse or something like that, you are making yourself, much, it's like tying your shoes before you put them on, you know what I mean? So to be very careful of that, to simplify as you go through problems continuously, um, so that you're not making more work for yourself. So the last uh, fact or, or note that I want, and it doesn't really belong here, but this is a good spot to, to say it, because we'll get to things like this later, is if we had something like this, an integral
let's say it's like this, and it's just with respect to y, a partial integral. What you're going to get is something like this. So we'll get right x over 2 tan of 2y. That would just pull that from the table plus 2xy squared. And we would normally have some c here, right? Constant of integration if we're doing an indefinite integral. Here's the thing, since we just integrated with respect to y, anything that was a function of x was treated as constant, right? So really, we should not think of the c as some general c, but as any function of x because it was being treated as constant. So if you find yourself in this situation, this should really be g of x because x was treated as constant in this moment. So the derivative um, with respect to y of g of x is 0. So when we integrate back up, we're going to get a function of the other variable because it was held constant, right? So that's why this isn't g of y, it's just g of x. So that's sometimes confusing the students of why, you know, I just integrated with respect to y, why am I getting a function of x as the constant, well, it's because x was being held constant when you integrated with respect to y, right? That was varying and x was pinned. What if it's not just x and y? What if you have like another variable in there and you had all two of them constant? Uh, so same thing, yes, you would have a, a two variable function of the other variables, right? So if you had a triple integral, which we will come across and we do partial integration, that constant would be, let's say we integrated with respect to x, Nate, it would be uh, some h of y and z. And that, you know, we might have to contend with that later. So it's something we have to be mindful of. So this is down the road, but it's kind of a good place to mention it here. This is not a double integral situation, but it is related to partial integration. So it should kind of be in your mind now uh, to kind of build that muscle. So that is it from me. Uh, other questions on any of this from today? Awesome. Good work sticking with it today. Um, next time we will be expanding on this, moving more into integration techniques. Um, again, we're going to start moving into different coordinate systems. When R, the region, is not a rectangle, how do we deal with that? Um, and lots of fun stuff. So enjoy your practice problems, and we'll see you next time. Later.